If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at ShireSociety.com. Heard from police and school board associations who felt their voices of knowledge and expertise should be considered. The committee unanimously agreed with those who felt this information is of great value to the legislature and executive departments. Vote was 17 to 0. So in short, you heard from a bunch of people wearing orange badges that they should be able to be here on basically taxpayer money. Uh, this is, in essence, compelled speech. It's what the previous speaker was talking about, to where money is being taken from one person, given to someone else, and then they speak in direct opposition to what the person who had the money taken from them wants or believes. I think this is definitely a good start. There is another bill, I forget the number, that would prohibit uh, basically bureaucrats from showing up unless they have permission of their supervisor, are invited by the chair of the committee, or take a vacation day in order to come up to testify. I think that's a much better bill, but HB 223 is definitely a step in the right direction, and I recommend ought to pass. I'm probably the only person wearing an orange badge that will make that recommendation to you today. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, would you believe that, um, do you think that some of the um, lobbies that, that are representing, you know, communities, towns, save taxpayer dollars by attending meetings? I find that hard to believe, and if that is a claim that's being made, I would love to see documentation. Uh, so since you're in favor of this, I'm assuming who, where do you get where does your lobby firm get its funds from? I'm a crowdfunded lobbyist, so people that like the ideas of liberty and want smaller government contribute to my firm. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, thank you for the testimony. I recognize Cordell Johnson. I will call uh, Daryl Perry. Who represents Liberty Lobby LLC and is opposed to the bill and has asked for two minutes. And I will take less time than that. I uh, want to point out most of the people that have been asking questions have been referencing uh, the uh, conflict of interest, but this actually amends incompatible offices and specifically only applies to municipal government. I, I do find it interesting that it doesn't also apply to the legislature, uh, and I can actually think of <coughs> two families that have multiple members in the legislature right now. One, uh, Senator Sanborn and his wife, Lori, and then there's Representatives Edwards, a father and daughter, who are actually members of different parties. So just because you're related does not mean that you're going to vote the same way on everything. And also, you need to think about how this is going to affect some of the smaller municipalities. There's a town near where I live, Roxbury, has about 160 registered voters. Not all of those voters are interested in running for office, so chances are, in small towns, you're not going to be able to fill seats with people that aren't somehow related. And if you're only going to apply it to relatives, why not also close friends? But then how do you define that? And then that goes back to the question about the unmarried couple that's been living together for a number of years and you know, uh, siblings. It does, and it includes stepchildren, but not step siblings. So what happens if you know, my father remarries and I've got a stepbrother that I don't know of? Could that somehow make us wind up not being able to run for office? And it seems to be a violation of individual rights to say you can't run because a family member currently serves. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair. No, thank you for taking my question, sir. Yes. Uh, would you agree with Representative Byron's definition of a conflict of interest that it's mostly fiduciary? Yes. Where someone, okay. Thank you. I've been to Roxbury. I yawned and missed it. But <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you.
Some called Cordell Johnston. I do oppose the bill. And for the record, Daryl Perry, CEO of Liberty Lobby LLC. Uh, I'm glad that Representative Hunt mentioned the free market. However, in the context of closing up a loophole, it does seem a little ironic because whenever a loophole is closed, that actually unfrees the market. Uh, I oppose the bill. I understand that it is a housekeeping measure because it's something that wasn't added last year. But, you know, again, closing loopholes is not good for the free market. And it's also unknown if any of the manufacturers that are selling at farmers markets aren't currently paying the tax thinking that they have to because of the section of statute that Representative Williams mentioned. So it's unknown whether or not the state is losing any of their money because this loophole exists. So I'll leave it at that and answer any questions. Any questions? Thank you very much. Next is Ann Freeman of the New Hampshire Liberty Party, who opposes the bill. Yep, um, I'm Ann Freeman from Keene, part of the New Hampshire, one of the co-chairs of the New Hampshire Liberty Party. Uh, I agree with uh, Daryl on this one. This bill goes in the wrong direction. If we want to support the free market, and I think that New Hampshire should be a very freedom-oriented place. I mean, our motto is live free or die. Um, if you have to pay some state bureaucrats because you want to sell some products at a farmer's market, that's not very freedom oriented. So um, I think that what we need to be looking at is ways to roll the state back and end taxes, reduce taxes and tax burdens on people who are out there manufacturing whatever product or service uh, that they would want to. So I'd like to see things go in a more free market direction and this bill doesn't do that. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Freeman? Thank you very much for your testimony. I have Heather Mullins from Antrim. Hey guys, thanks for hearing me today. I couldn't help but want to share my two cents in after listening because um, I've actually been in the, an activist for a few near, years now. I just moved here from Massachusetts where we not only just legalize, we legalize that, we also legalize marijuana recreationally. Um, so now that I'm here, a good friend of mine actually is the founder of the Virginia Industrial Hemp Organization, and so he's always been championing me like all the different uses of industrial hemp, which is not just limited to like paper or cotton clothing, but one of its best uses is actually chemical cleanup because it's kind of like a mop crop. So it can actually pull waste out of water faster than any other crop, and it was proven by Dr. Keith Cobalt who is an Australian researcher. So the data is all there for that. I think somebody had a question earlier, why is the federal government, every time these bills go in there, nothing ever gets done about it. And I think essentially what controlled substance mean is it's a control of the market. It's not necessarily a control of the substance. So the federal government, <laughs> we all know that substances that are controlled are still on the streets. It's just, where's the profits going? And as far as industrial hemp goes, by controlling it, we're limiting people in New Hampshire from utilizing this crop and essentially bettering our own economy, hoping that the federal government will give us permission to someday. So by taking a stand saying that people in New Hampshire should have the ability to use this crop you know, to better their lives, whether it's for creating paper, whether it's for chemical cleanups, whether it's for all the different uses of it, we're really missing out the longer we go by, by having it as a controlled substance. And that includes marijuana. Because if you look at Seattle, I have a friend of mine in Seattle, they brought in a billion dollars in revenue in the state from legalizing marijuana. That's a billion dollars that New Hampshire could have cashed in on that we could have used to promote other things and grow up our economy here had we done the same thing. But now we're actually gonna be losing out to Massachusetts and Maine because we're right smack dab in the middle and all of that revenue is gonna go to those two states. So essentially what control means is really just controlling the money, controlling the market. It's not necessarily controlling the substance. So I think, you know, I support, um, you know, this bill and prohibiting the designation that it's a controlled substance. And I think we should allow people to use it and grow and prosper. And, you know, that's my, my position on it, so. Okay, thank you, Representative Suffolk. Make sure I get this. Suffolk Yes. 
Um, I would just, um, as a registered nurse, yeah. I would like to um, rebuke your statement about control. The control is set by the Drug Enforcement Agency, mm -hmm. and um, it gives physicians and advanced practice nurses the right to prescribe drugs. So it's not the government controlling what people have access to. Drugs are, are scheduled. Schedule 1, Schedule 2, Schedule 3, how they're available to who. And that this is, is a control on the market. Now, it doesn't have anything to control the market. It, when a drug is controlled, it means that it's controlled within the, the Drug Enforcement Agency as per schedule of which person can dispense that drug. And which person can profit off of the sale of that drug. I'm not talking about profit, dear. I'm talking about under the licensing that's given by the state, mm -hmm. who can dispense the drug. Good representative, do you have a question for her? No, that was just my comment. Okay. All right, thank you. We, we usually do comments like that uh, at executive session amongst okay. ourselves. Anybody else further have a uh, question? I, I would like to oh, ask a question. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for taking my question. Um, I, I'm wondering if um, if you can tell us if there is a uh, if there's a difference. And I don't want to get into the the the, um, the pure economic differences between marijuana mm -hmm. and industrial hemp. But I think that in the, if, if I understand correctly, the processing of these two plants is really quite different. That uh, marijuana is fairly easy to harvest and therefore use and sell. But hemp is a different, do, do you know, do you know how, how hemp is processed? It's broken down into like the level of like THC that like the hemp plant itself contains, which is like so low. So it's almost like the, the equivalent of you know, you can have different levels. Do you know what I mean? So, so the level of THC in the hemp plant is not, it's so, you'd need like a whole field of it in order to gather up the amount of THC that it would take for somebody smoking like a marijuana, for example, to actually get like a high from. But I mean, regardless, my position on these either way is more or less like individual freedom and, and that people shouldn't be restricted in, in terms of, you know, if they're not harming anyone and, and they want to use hemp, for example, or even marijuana, if they're doing so responsibly in a way that, you know, doesn't affect anybody else, why would we be here having these conversations? You know, like, let's prosper together. May I, may I have a follow-up? Follow-up? Um, I'll do this quickly. Uh, I, uh, my, my purpose, I guess, was not to talk about individual freedom. Uh, I, was, I was trying to approach the subject from the standpoint of, uh, of actually being, you know, of a farmer uh, growing hemp and then, and then having to go through the process of, it had nothing to do with uh, THC levels. It's how, if you know how uh, farmers have to process uh, this plant in order to make a commercial success of its uh, sale and distribution. Um, uh, Maybe the same as any other crop, you know? Like, um, we yeah. had... Okay, what do you mean? So you're at, like, the harvesting of the, the pl and plant? And we'll discussion amongst the representative. We'll do that during the executive session. Do you have any other questions? <clears throat> Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And we have representative... We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.